Republican Senator Patricia Rucker and the challenger, Democrat John Doyle. And uh, each of you will get a minute to, to two minutes for an opening statement. We'll reverse the order for the closing statement. Uh, toward the end, we'll take a break in the middle, uh, about uh, 25 minutes into this. In between, you'll get questions from Bill Stubblefield, former president of the Berkeley County Commission, retired admiral, yeah. and uh, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, both of whom are co-host on the uh, program uh, with us during the course of the week. If your name is invoked by your uh, opponent, you have the opportunity for a direct response at the conclusion of their sentence. Uh, normally, we would ask you to restrict your answers to one to two minutes. However, I know the two of you are used to doing a format that allows for more extensive time, and we do have a full hour. So uh, try to be as brief as possible, but don't feel as though you're constricted by a minute to two minutes. We have a little bit more time to play with here today. Bill, you can go first here. Oh, not not going to have an opening statement. Or, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah. already off track. Uh, yeah. John Doyle, you will go first. Well, thank you, uh, John Gerlstrap, Rob Mario, and Bill Stubblefield, and, and Mike Hornby, and WRNR Channel 10, and everybody else that had anything to do with this, I thank you. Um, I'm John Doyle. I'm running for the state Senate in the 16th District. I served 26 years in the House of Delegates. Uh, I'm a graduate of Shepherd University, uh, served in the Army in Vietnam, and I hold a Bronze Star with a, with a V device uh, and the Combat Infantry Badge. I stand for clean air, clean water, good public schools. I want to restore reproductive freedom to the women of West Virginia, uh, and I, I want to uh, uh, have West Virginia pass a law guaranteeing the right to repair any product that you buy. Thank you, John. Senator Rucker. Thank you very much. Thanks for this opportunity and for hosting this. I am Patricia Rucker, the state senator for the 16th District. I have had the pleasure of serving for eight years. Most folks know I am a first-generation immigrant from Venezuela, came here when I was six years old, have lived in West Virginia since 2000, and I have uh, five children with my husband in Harpers Ferry. I'm very grateful to have been able to be working the last eight years on improving our schools, improving school choice, giving more opportunities for families to be able to thrive, lowering taxes, and reducing regulations. I'm down there in Charleston being a voice for the Eastern Panhandle, fighting for locality pay, fighting for the folks here getting the attention that we deserve, improving our roads, and there's still a lot more to get, be done. So I'm running for re-election again, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Thank you both for your opening statements. And uh, I'm actually, it won't be you going first in this one, Bill. Okay. It will be John Gilstrap. All right, very well. I'll start with uh, Mr. Hardy. On <laughs> Or Mr. With who? Doyle. Right, or Doyle. Okay. Or Doyle. It could be Doyle. Uh, uh, please apologize to John Hardy right now. Yes. Uh, effusively. Um, uh, on your website, the, among your issues, you call for a 15% across the board pay raise for teachers in West Virginia, plus an additional 10% for teachers in the border counties like uh, uh, Jefferson and, and, and Berkeley. Plus, you want corrections for the woefully underfunded EPA, and you call it the height of folly to eliminate the state income tax. So these are all pretty expensive programs. So how much taxation are we looking at in, to fund the programs that, that you see important to the state? Well, for, first of all, it's not the EPA. It's the DEP, the Department of Environmental Fair Protection. Uh, yes, those things do cost money. One way to raise additional money, I believe, would be to uh, legalize adult use of cannabis. I think that would produce a lot more money than even the formal estimates. Uh, because of the increased tourism, it will get us, particularly into the southern half of the state, uh, where, uh, that, where I am told by people who like to use it, some of the best marijuana in the world is grown. Uh, it, it will be a great attraction. That is one way to raise additional money. Uh, I do think... We need to, to stop this idea of doing away with the income tax. Uh, it is true that in some cases, if you reduce taxes, you improve the economy to the point where some of that lost revenue is increased. You never get all of it back, but you do get some. But a tax that is reduced to zero will produce zero revenue. Senator Rucker. Would you like me to respond to him or to your question? Because obviously those were not proposals of mine. 
respond to, I guess, respond to his his response. Okay, sure. I'll be happy to. Um, so I'm a supporter of reducing and, if we can, eliminating the personal income tax. I can tell you that we have been doing it responsibly, and I support continuing to do it responsibly, With, which means you reduce the taxes as you have the funds to do so. Maybe there are other ways we can further reduce by cutting government, but I would not um, support um, you just cutting for no, you know, without any way of funding it. Um, so I just want to make that clear. In terms of how it will help our economy, it has been shown over and over again. I, I could point out to many states' examples where they reduce the taxes, the revenues actually increase because you have more folks spending money, more folks being attracted to your state, and all you have to do is look at some of states like North Carolina, Texas, Florida, and I could go on, who have seen this incredible turnaround. Um, additionally, I want to point out that, you know, we all want to see increased um, salaries for employees and locality pay. We both support that. Uh, most of the folks representing the Eastern Panhandle have been fighting for it. There are reasonable ways in which I think we can get there, and it does not mean that we have to stop reducing taxes or um, raise taxes. Um, we have revenues within the state that we can choose to prioritize as we see fit. And I do think that some of these things that we have been spending money on in Charleston, uh, mainly administration in the state uh, Department of Education, could be reallocated. So if I may follow up on that, it's sure. kind of in, in the same sleeve here. Um, on your website, you specifically talk about uh, addressing some environmental issues, the Elk River chemical leak, for example, and you blame the lack of inspections. We need to have more inspectors, uh, which would, to me means increasing the staffing of the DEP, and which would mean spending more on, on government at the same time that we're cutting back on, on government. Is, I, how do we balance I, actually, that equation? I didn't call for No, I think he inspe- means my website. Okay, I was going to say. Okay, yeah. sorry. No, I, it's, it's on your website, ma'am. Um, I talk about clean rivers, and I actually hmm. support the Adopt a Stream program, but I can tell you that I didn't call for more inspectors. No, no, no. You blame the lack of inspection on the the problem with the Elk River Yes, leaks. that there was lack of inspection. And we – so when we go down there in Charleston, it is um, very simple to react to crises. But we actually have – Laws in the books are not being enforced. And that particular scenario, we're talking about laws that were not being enforced. So we had it in the books that it was supposed to be inspected every so often, and it was not being done. That is what I was pointing out. And one of the things I have as part of my campaign is getting the government to do what it's supposed to be doing and maybe stop doing things that it shouldn't be. Uh, if I could follow up on that, Senator Rucker's right. That place wasn't inspected, and it was supposed to have been. And I believe the reason is that the DEP is underfunded and does not have enough inspectors. And you disagree with that, Senator Rucker? So I have not ever heard the DEP come before us and tell us that they need more inspectors. I will tell you that um, we haven't cut them. So if they feel that they do not have enough to do their job, I would assume that they would come and present that to us. I'm definitely not opposed to right size of government. Uh, Let me say, she is right. The DEP has not come to the legislature, and I believe that is a decision on the part of the governor. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. And uh, now Mr. Stubblefield. Thank you, folks, for running for office. Rarely have we seen two more qualified, articulate, passionate people than the two of you with such divergent views. I don't know of anything that you really agree on. <laughs> but Politically. Actually, politi- yeah, there are a couple, politi- yeah. Politically, yeah. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that you do have uh, in reflection of this is your view of education system. Uh and you have been very clear in your views and how they diverge from your, your opponent's views. Is there anything that can be done, is there any possibility that parts of your individual views can be merged 
to make a better, better educational system? And I'll start with you first, Senator Rector. Well, thank you for that question. That's an excellent question. Actually, when um, Delegate Doe was in the House, um, we worked together on some of those education policies. And um, I can't tell you that he, he has a wealth of knowledge, which I'm really grateful. He was there for many, many years before I ever got elected. And I'm very grateful to lean on his understanding and knowledge of the public education system in the state of West Virginia. Having said that, you know, we both support um, locality pay, like I said, more competitive wages here in the Eastern Panhandle. I think we both support trying to help the public education system be more successful. Um, it's just a question of, you know, different ways of getting there, but I think we could easily work together on our, our ideas. You know, one of my main thrusts has been, I really truly believe we need better leaders in the schools. So, you know, we have increased salaries, not to the point they need to be, but we have. Um, we've put more money into mental health support for students. We have put more money into wraparound services in our schools. We have further invested into safety and security in our schools. But none of these things have really made a difference in the morale. And I really feel that good leadership is going to be the really biggest component that we should next tackle. And we did have the State Board of Education start a leadership training school for good principals, assistant principals, and superintendents, but COVID interrupted it. And so now that we've kind of, things have settled down, I think we need to refocus on that. And I, I don't know, but I, I believe that he, um, that John would probably support that. Um, I, I do support uh, what you said so far. Okay. <laughs> I do think, though, Bill, I, I sense that maybe your question was also directed toward things like charter schools and uh, and, and 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 homeschooling and, and that sort of thing. And this is where Senator Rucker and I have disagreed. First of all, before I get to that, let me point out the last time I saw really good morale among our public school teachers and service workers was in the early to mid 90s after under Gaston Caperton the legislature had a huge pay increase that took our teachers from 48th in the nation to something like 30th we were basically at the middle of the pack and for a number of years we were close to the middle of the pack and there was tremendous morale we weren't losing teachers then to nearby states we have to get back get that back again we're not going to get the morale if we don't bite the bullet and pay them what they're worth now as as to charter schools and private schools philosophically i believe that the public school system more than anything else made america the greatest nation in the world it's this idea that came about in the early part of the 19th century that it is the responsibility of the government to make sure everyone is educated we were the first nation, uh, at least in, in, in Western society, to come up with that idea. Uh, granted, there are flaws with it, but, but my answer is to fix the flaws, not junk the system. Now, having said that, I think this idea of charter schools and, uh, and, and all the things that go with it, I, I think that ship has probably sailed. We're going to have those things. I do think we m need much, much tighter regulation uh, on homeschooling, on, on charter schools, on, on uh, pods, whatever you want to call them, uh, than we have now. And it's not just because of what happened to that young lady, Kennedy Miller. Uh, it's things like, uh, I think the rules are too loose if, if, if a parent, say, buys a computer and really intends to use it for their own use but they get the tax break from the government because they say it's for the kids' education. Uh, I, I, I think in most cases it probably is, but I don't think we have the controls in place to make sure that's always the case. Ms. Rucker, you uh, want to respond? Sure, I would love from the, to. From the charter school aspect and home rule. Right. Well, I have to, I mean, because he brought in history, yeah. I have to yeah. point out that um, America became great way before the mid-19th century. And actually, at the very beginning of the founding, you had most folks being educated at home, including most of our founding fathers, with, you know, high-quality tutors that they would hire. It was it was what really started off the nation. And in terms of this choices and options so 
in the United States of America, we have always had choices and options when it comes to education. Those who could afford it would get the very best education that they could for their child. Um, yes, thankfully, we have had an incredible public education system in the United States of America, which has been very successful in helping to equalize the, uh, the vast majority of the population when it comes to the most basic skills. But parents and families have always strived to get the best education they want for their child. What we are choosing to do in the state of West Virginia and recently and through a lot of my efforts, um, we have chosen to try to take away the fact that only the very rich can afford that choice and to equalize the opportunity for all so that all parents and all families, no matter what their income, could strive for what is best for their child. And in the state of West Virginia, I can tell you, every single child matters. I think it's discriminatory to think that you, this one particular category, deserves the option to have a private education. This category does not. This category can afford to have a mother that stays at home and educated home. This other category can't. So what I would like to see is that everyone pursue what fits best for their family and support that wholeheartedly. And every single study that has been done ever since school choice has begun in the United States, we're one of the last ones to adopt it, has shown that the public schools improve when there is choice. Uh, if I could follow up on that, uh, I, I, I think Sen Senator Rucker makes the point about uh, it's much easier for, some, for a family that's wealthy to be, to be able to afford their, to send their child to private school. One of the changes I would make in the current law is if we are going to use taxpayer money to subsidize private education, it should only go to those parents who would not otherwise be able to afford it. That is one of the changes I would make. I want to thank you both. You did very well by avoiding the question I ask. Oh. <laughs> and the question I ask was... I really didn't <laughs> think either one of us did, Bill, but, but enlighten but, us. But how could your different approaches be merged to to make a, a better school system? So. Uh, actually, I thought I threw out a couple of olive branches there uh, about uh, possible compromises. Well, I will say <laughs> that, again, the, the, the current system that we have now, where we are funding public yeah. education and continuing to make investments in public education while still supporting um, choices for parents is kind of a merge. And I also want to point out that, you know, so he has ideas for regulations or, or further ways. Those are things I'm more than happy to hear what his concerns sure. are and, and make tweaks as needed. We actually had a cleanup bill just this last session when it came to charter schools and uh, Hope Scholarship. So. Can we make improvements? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And, and if I could be guaranteed that we would much more fully fund public schools than we have, I'd be a lot more willing to accept some of the ideas that Senator Rucker has thrown out. Thank you. I'd like to stay on education here for a moment, John. Are you changing? Yeah, that's what I wanted, no, I wanted to stay on education. Stay on education? Go right ahead. Okay. Um, I kind of want to double down on what you just said, John. The, 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 West Virginia is actually in the top third of per capita spending on, on education. But the statistics that I have here, for seventh graders in West Virginia, 31% uh, perform at grade level in math and 39% perform at grade level um, uh, in ELA, English Language Arts. Uh, those are abysmal numbers. That puts us, uh, Mississippi and West Virginia are constantly battling for last place. I'm not, is this really a, a dollars and cents issue? Um, and is this something that the legislature can pass? We've been addressing this certainly at WRNR for at least since I've been there, which is almost two years. And the needle hasn't moved a lot and everybody seems to be pointing at somebody else. What, in, y in, in your points of view one at a time here, what is the right string to pull to actually start moving these numbers? The answer to your two questions, to the first is yes, into the second is yes with difficulty. Uh, you are right that we are really high in dollar per student. But if you just look at the amount of money that gets into the classroom, we're quite low. Uh, and well, much so you, of the, you mentioned spending more fully funding public education. Yes, I did. And to me, that means getting money into the classroom. And the reason for that apparently high dollar 
is that much of it goes into administration, and it is directed there by the federal government. And it is because West Virginia has the, the, just about the lowest per capita income in the country. Therefore, so much more of our education dollars come from the federal government and are subject to direction by the federal government. And some of those directions, I think, are good. Some are not. But I think we need to have many more state tax dollars go into the public schools directed into the classroom in the form of salaries for public school teachers and school service workers, and then we will begin getting the better results. Well, I appreciate you pointing out those um, statistics. There's many others that I could share, and it is really disheartening, I will tell you honestly. Um, so it is absolutely correct what John said, that not all of those dollars that we are putting in are in really making an impact in the classroom. A lot of it is in administration. We've actually attempted to try to, I call it right size, um, State Board of Education, but it is really, really difficult to do so, I will tell you. And it really has to come with cooperation of the executive branch, which unfortunately we haven't really had that. Um, in terms of what can really move the needle, so there have been countless studies um, of successful public schools and not successful public schools. And three things are key. Class size does seem to matter. Unfortunately or fortunately, depending on what you um, think of it, actually when it comes to class size, West Virginia is actually doing really well, but that's of course mostly because we are a small rural state with a small population. Our average class size is around 11. Um, that's not what we're facing in the Eastern Panhandle. But just in terms of the things that, ma that seem to matter in terms of how well a school is doing, class size, like I said, leadership in the school, it is been um, one of the number one things that can turn the school around. So you have a really good principal and a school that was underperforming has turned around in just a few years, which is the reason for why I brought up, I think it's time to refocus on that, and parental involvement. So those are the three things that study after study after study, research after research after research, even across the world, not just in the United States. Those are the three things that seem to make a really crucial difference. You can't really legislate parental involvement. I will tell you that when I first got elected, I did go down to Charleston and I tried to see if we could implement some of the things that they did in Montgomery County Public Schools, which is where I used to teach. They did have a parental involvement coordinator, which growing government, right? So it didn't go very far. But that is one of the ideas that um, I brought from Montgomery County, that they have a person whose job it is to get the parents more involved in the schools. I have to tell you, COVID did disrupt a lot of things. Not only that leadership training that the state superintendent was starting to do, but also the parental involvement is worse than it's ever been. The schools kicked out parents and anyone who did not have to be into that building out of safety concerns. And they still do not have the numbers of parents volunteering and coming in that they used to have. But honestly, you can't legislate that. And so there is a role, of course, adequate funding, absolutely I would support. Finding more ways to ensure that the money gets to the classroom and doesn't get stuck in administration would be something I would strive for and fight for and continue to do so. But there is going to be a part of the culture that we're going to have to all work together as a community to change that is not going to happen because of state legislature. Um, uh, Senator Rucker is right in that overall West Virginia's class size is, is pretty small relative to the rest of the country. Uh, but she's also right that is not true here in the Eastern Panhandle. And I think it drives home the point that I've been trying to make. Whereas underfunding of the classroom is a problem statewide, that problem is seriously exacerbated here in the Eastern Panhandle. We are going to take our halftime break, for lack of a better way of putting it here. <laughs> Give you both a chance to catch your breath. We'll be back with more with Senator Patricia Rucker and John Doyle, former delegate, member of the House of Delegates. And we'll do that in uh, four minutes. Four minutes. Thanks. 
If you or someone you know suffers from the disease of addiction, help is available. From the Berkeley County Quick Response Team, with peer recovery coaches and support promptly to the homes of those who've recently experienced an overdose. This collective effort towards recovery brings resources and services to the community, including naloxone and treatment options. Call 304-267-1313 or visit the Berkeley County Recovery Resource Center at 800 Emmett Rouse Drive, Martinsburg. The Berkeley County Quick Response Team is funded through a DHHR grant with the Berkeley Morgan County Health Department. West Virginians are fiercely independent and mountaineers should always be free to choose. We want to be left alone to live our lives as we see fit. Why should politicians dictate what we can and cannot do with our bodies? Women deserve the same rights that every man has. All fight to protect your right to privacy and to make your own health care decisions. I'm Stephen Wendelin, and I'm asking for your vote this November. Paid for by Wendelin for Congress. We are the Skinner Brothers. Most folks only need a lawyer once or twice in their lives. And when they're injured or in an accident, most people don't know what to do. We get it, it can be overwhelming. Nobody likes to be told, you need a lawyer. But that's why we're here. We wanna get you back to your normal life and help you recover. So if you or a loved one has been in an accident, give us a call. Let us figure out how we can get you compensation. Reach us at SkinnerWins.com or Google Skinner Lawyers. We'll treat you like family. WB Medicine is pleased to introduce six new providers who've joined University Health Associates East and our medical staffs at Berkeley Medical Center and Jefferson Medical Center. Dr. Brian Robertson, Allergy. Dr. Rebecca Schufer, General Surgery. Nurse Practitioner Bridget Stoddard, Pediatrics. Dr. Venkata Signanum, Psychiatry. Dr. Sydney Zariello, Emergency Medicine. And Dr. Elizabeth Supowicz, Bariatrics, General Surgery. Welcome to WBU Medicine. following is from an actual phone call. Hello there. I'm a volunteer with End of Life Choices, and you knew a gentleman, Edward who was coming out to use Oregon's Death with Dignity Law. I actually worked with him, and he wanted me to reach out to you once he died to let you know that he did pass yesterday. So I did want to get that message to you. Thank you so much. Bye. Let's not let this happen in West Virginia. Vote to permanently ban medically assisted suicide. Vote for Amendment 1. Mommy, where does flavor come from? Well, um, when people love food, they cook it on a Traeger grill. Meat, corn, even pie. <laughs> and then the Traeger does the rest, which brings everyone to celebrate this beautiful thing that they've created. Because when you share delicious food with your friends, that's the flavor of life. Shop now and save at Orsini's today. Life is evolving. Over the past decade, the way we do almost everything has changed. Get on your phone, see something you like, click on it, and it shows up at your door. Why should the way you have your car serviced be any different? Why waste your time going to a dealership service department when Hager Sound Ford and Hancock Chevrolet will come to you? They service all makes, all models, and offer full parts and labor warranties. Hager Sound Ford and Hancock Chevrolet will come to your door or office and service your vehicle while you're doing what you need to be doing, conducting that business meeting or mowing the lawn. Why take time out of your busy schedule when you don't have to? Hagerstown Ford and Hancock Chevrolet's friendly, knowledgeable staff will come to you where you live or where you work for full service maintenance. From oil changes to tire rotations, brakes, batteries, multi-point inspections, they handle it all. Hagerstown Ford and Hancock Chevrolet is committed to delivering the best of the best to their customers. Trust them to service your vehicle where you're at, at home or at work. Skip the time-consuming and terminal wait at the dealership. Schedule your appointment at FordofHagerstown.com or HancockChevy.com. You're watching TV 10 Martinsburg and WRNR uh, Martinsburg on your uh, audio feed as well as our Facebook live stream. We thank everybody for joining us. And if you uh, are catching this on the replay, it'll be replayed frequently before the November 5 election day as well. And you can always catch uh, the uh, individualized segments on our YouTube channel as well as we continue with our discussion with the incumbent from the West Virginia 16th, Senator Patricia Rucker and former delegate uh, John Doyle here. Bill Stubblefield, John Gilstrap asking questions as we continue along in the second half of this hour segment with these two. Bill? About a year, year and a half ago, DHHR was broken into three different departments. The question is, has this resulted in more efficient service or more complete coverage 
for groups such as foster child care or foster care and uh, child care, child protective service and the like. Start with you first, uh, Mr. Doyle. Um, I was in favor for a number of years of breaking it into two. Uh, I still think that would have been the wiser course of action. Uh, I think this Department of, of Health Care Facilities probably should have been kept as part of the Department of Health. But having said all that, I think the answer to your question, Bill, is it has improved some but not enough. Uh, the, I've always thought, not always, but after I had been in the legislature for maybe a number of years, uh, I, I, it, it came to me that good structure does not make bad people do good work. But bad structure does interfere with the ability of good people to do good work. We had a bad structure before. Uh, I think the structure we have is better now. Uh, I think we need to get the right people into it. And I, I have had many quarrels with how Jim Justice has run the state of West Virginia during the eight years he is governor. Uh, and I think this is one of the examples. Uh, he has not had the right people in those positions for a long time. Uh, and I am hoping that the next governor, uh, whether it is Steve Williams or Patrick Morrissey, uh, will put really first-rate people in charge of each of these three uh, departments. And then I think you'll see some real improvement. Thank you. Senator? Well, the, I, I, I agree with um, what Delegate – or sorry, John – Dole just said. I will tell you that, um, so in terms of have we seen great improvement? Not yet, but what we have seen is greater transparency. We have a better idea of where the money's going. We have a greater idea of who's doing what, and that kind of has to happen first. So I think we're getting what we were hoping for, which is more information that's going to help us really drill down on the actual things that are keeping our kids from getting the care they need, keeping adults from getting the care they need. Um, so I think it's a, it's, we're getting there. So we're moving uh, to making progress. I will tell you that um, it is something that is very close to my heart. I've been the chair of children and families for seven years up until last year. Um, we've, we have passed four major reforms of foster care and it's just scratching the surface. It is such a huge problem in the state of West Virginia and one that it is a very personal for me because the welfare of our kids is the whole reason I ran for office. Thank you. Follow-up, Bill? No, no follow-up, thank you. John? Each of you alludes to issues with how the government spends the money and we can call it wasteful spending or misallocation of funds. Um, the question to both of you is, we'll start with Senator Rucker, where are the greatest sources of wasteful spending, and how would you reallocate it? Well, that's the million-dollar question. <laughs> Isn't it, though? <laughs> um, it's it's a actually softball. the $14 yes, billion yes, dollar right. question. <laughs> yes. um, it is really difficult for me to tell you, like, particular oh. places, but I will say this. Um, in many branches of our government, we have what I call – bloated bureaucracy. So a lot of folks concentrated in Charleston making decisions. Uh, I'm sure if you were to line them up, they will all be able to tell you why they're, it's important that they be where they are. But the state of West Virginia actually, I think, could improve dramatically by a much more um, bottom-up sort of government versus top down. So we are 55 counties spread out really geographically diverse areas with very unique needs. And I don't need to tell that to anyone in the Eastern Panhandle. We are completely facing different challenges than most of the part of the state. It's really hard to justify the decisions are being made our, for our part of the state down in Charleston, which is facing completely different world. And what they're surrounded by our needs and issues that we they, they just do not understand what's going on here. So I could I could tell you Can you give me an example? Well, of a department. Not a, not an individual, but a department. Well, like the Department of Highways is a great example. So 
in most of the areas of the state, um, when they fix a road, it's going to be okay for a long amount of time. There's not that many vehicles going on it. There's some exceptions, like the major interstates, but it's a very different world here in the Eastern Panhandle. So when we tell them, hey, potholes and this road needs to be resurfaced and it's cracking and breaking and it's literally deteriorating, um, they respond, well, it's we're scheduled to do that once every 10 years. Okay, that might work in some parts of the state. It's not going to necessarily work in our part of the state. And we tried in this last legislative session, the um, I can tell you the Eastern Panhandle delegation really worked hard trying to get our own uh, regional office here for Department of Highways. We failed to do so. Um, a lot of it was the executive branch opposed it. But I think, again, um, we're having decisions being made by folks who are not on the ground, seeing what is really needed. And you know what? I'm not just trying to speak for the Eastern Panhandle because I'm sure it's the same way in some rural parts of West Virginia that is not getting attention that they need for particular areas also for the same thing. So that's just one example. Uh, if I could pick up on, uh, I, I have an answer ready, but but when Senator Rucker brought up the Division of Highways, uh, I want to weigh in. She's absolutely right, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples. It isn't just fixing the roads. It's planning for the future. Uh, our Division of Highways has a tendency to presume that if there is a congestion problem somewhere, what they need to do is do what it takes to fix that problem, and it will be fixed forever. They presume there will be no additional traffic at that intersection. And that may be true for many parts of West Virginia, but it isn't true here. And I'm going to give two examples. A number of years ago, Berkeley County was basically forced to decide, do we want the Raleigh Street extension or do we want the Eastern Bypass. We should have had both. They were both necessary for future growth here, growth that we have already by now had. That's the weakness. Uh, and, and in Jefferson County, Jefferson County is, has the highest vehicular traffic per day of any county in the state that does not have an interstate highway, yet we still have uh, probably the biggest bottleneck in the entire state at Harper's Ferry. I think there are ways to fix it. Uh, it, 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 it needs to be, you need to work with the, uh, with the park service. And I think there are ways to do it and preserve the view shed at Harper's Ferry, but nobody seems interested in doing it. Now back to the answer I was going to give. Uh, I served for 19 years on the house finance committee. And back then what we would do, each member of the finance committee was given a, a set of agencies to make sure that, 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 that their budget request was not excessive. And I used to go to each one of them and sit down and say, okay, here's your request. Can we get rid of this? Can we, get, can we reduce this? And I would be able to jawbone them down. And there were years that we saved $15, $20 million a year in the budget by just going at it uh, one by one. They don't do that now. Another way we did it was when we had the budget conference, and for 12 of those years, uh, I was uh, selected at the beginning of the session as a member of the budget conference committee. And we had a real conference between the House and Senate as to the Senate would have appropriated, say, $2 million more for something than we did. And so the question is, where is it going to be? And our, our job is to try and get them down as close to our figure as possible. There's to get them. And, and these were – the, the, the media actually attended these. Um, the, they don't do that anymore. It's just the, the two finance chairs just get together and agree in private. I think – and and this was the last speech I made on the floor of the House. My last day, I said, we've got to fix the budget project process. It has It has atrophied. And that I think uh, uh, they're just that I think is the solution is to go at it one by one. I remember one time, and I'm sorry to go so long, but some of you in the in, in the room may remember somebody named Spike Maynard, who was a state Supreme Court justice, 
And he was in one year presenting the court's budget. And I suggested that one of the ways we could get some, 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 some savings, we have a board of parole, which has parole officers. We have a board of probation, which has probation officers. I said, why not combine them and have these individuals cross-trained? We could get some cost savings. And the problem is the, state, the Supreme Court said, we'll agree to that if it, if it is under the state Supreme Court not under this, this governor's agency that, that the Board of, of, of Probation was. So there's where, where you were. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> um, and I just want to follow up, you know, that I, I was not there during that time that the budget was done that way. I do believe that the budget should be done in a more transparent manner. So I will say that I could see we, where we could improve that. I'm not a member of finance, have not served in that uh, committee, so I can't speak hand to, you know personally about that experience but I will just point out part of my hesitation to point out exact areas of waste is because of that lack of transparency you know it's very difficult for me if I'm not sitting in those meetings and I'm not getting that proper information to know exactly where to drill down but I know that there is way way too much um, waste and one of the reasons I know this is because our population has gone down in the state of West Virginia, but the size of the government continues to grow. Bill? Has PEIA been fixed, or is it still broken? <laughs> still broken. <laughs> okay. Um, Senator? I don't think a fix is really possible in one legislation or one swell swoop, but I – there are some folks who would like to see it privatized. Some folks who would like to, they like to point out to ex the example of how we managed, um, you know, our unfunded liabilities and we're doing so much better in that area. And they'd like to see us maybe look in ways that we can follow that model with PEIA. But what is, I think, the most important um, to remember, we do want a good insurance package for our state employees. We want them to feel secure and, and know that they're going to be taken care of. Absolutely. Um, there is a lot of, of angst because after seven years of us not raising PEIA at all, we are now having to make adjustments for those seven years and, and make it go back to the promise of 80-20, where the state picks up 80% and the employee 20, and we're trying to get there. So yes, that, that is going to force some increases right now, but at the end of the day, that's necessary for it to be consistent with what we promised the employees, which was that we, the state, are going to do 80%, and also make it feasible. So I am definitely on the, um, I guess you'd say on the bandwagon of let's get it right, but I don't think it's going to happen in just one or two years. It's going to take some time. Before you go, Mr. Doyle, let me ask a quick follow-up. Yes. Is the problem with the implementation or the concept? Hmm, that's a really good question, Bill. Um, you know, I can't say it's the implementation because I wasn't really there when it was being implemented. But you mentioned it had been going seven years without collecting. That would be part well, of the implementation. Well, no, because, okay, so the, the PIA was basically set before I ever got elected, and I'm just saying the first seven years that we had Governor Justice as governor, he chose to freeze what the employee's amount was going to be so it didn't go up. So it's not really implementation. It's more of he just decided to we would cover that extra cost, but that, that's not, that's not going to be the long-term way mm. of dealing with it. So we finally, you know, have to start adjusting that back. But the reason for why I say it's a very good question is because I don't really know what kind of drawbacks there were in the implementation that may have impacted. And when it comes to the concept, I mean, I think the concept is good. Um, the, the fact that we are offering you a really good insurance package is, is good. But did anyone look at other ways of doing it? I'm not certain. Um, I, I agree with much of what Senator Rucker said. Uh, I think this is one more example of, of Jim Justice not doing the job properly as governor. Uh, I think the legislature had Justice not weighed in in his second year as governor 
and said, we're going to freeze the employee contribution, I think the legislature would have stuck with that 80-20. I think they would have been able to sell it to the employees as, yes, we're raising your contribution. We are raising the state's contribution as well. Uh, they had agreed on the 80-20. And, I, and I, I think while certainly the employees would not have liked to seen it go up, they would have understood why and they would, have, would not have had the serious mistrust of the system that they have now. I also think that if we were to privatize it, the mistrust would be even greater. So I do not think that is a viable solution. Uh, quick question on PEIA. Uh -huh. I understand it from some of the complaints that we've received is uh, every time uh, you make more money, you have run the risk of being sent into a higher premium bracket. So every time the state gives a 5% raise, of which there have been five during the Justice Administration, as I understand it, uh, potentially teachers go into a higher bracket because the premiums are based on your income. Is there any type of inflation rider or anything that accounts for raises as these things take place with the premiums? And that's not just teachers. It's all state employees. Yes. And, yeah, it's, it's everybody. It's a whole lot of people. Correct. And, 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 and yes, that is true with the income tax as well. Uh, what we need to do is provide our employees salaries that are for – sufficient for them to be able to absorb these raises and then still have some extra money in their pocket. Yeah, that's a, that's a bigger battle plan, though. Um, I'm looking, that's right. I'm looking for little victories here. Senator Rucker, <laughs> anything there? Well, I, Give I, him his little victory. I, I was going to say I, I do believe that there are, infl there are inflation riders in it, but I can't mm. tell you the exact uh, percentage. And I also want to point out that um, it, it was four – five percent increases and then there was one raise that wasn't a five percent i think it was closer to three percent it was a flat dollar amount yeah a flat dollar amount exactly okay. so i just want to make sure that's corrected um one of those races basically just covered the increases in pia i believe that was last year yes. um so we we do understand and we don't want to hurt our state employees but again it is a question of doing things responsibly and making certain that we get it so that it is a viable, safe insurance program that's going to last and be there for all of our state employees. I mean, that is the goal. Um, so that is one of the things that um, folks do have to understand. The entire nation is seeing, seeing rising cost of health care. It is actually one of the fastest growing um, in terms of prices and inflation um, costs in our entire economy. And you know, West Virginia is, 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 is going to, of course, see that, too. Um, we're, we're not um, in any way, you know, buffered from those changes that are happening. So it is something that everyone is paying more for. I am someone who is not on PIA. I'm covered by my husband's insurance, and he works for the federal government. And I can tell you our health care cost and the amount of money that we're contributing has gone up substantially also. John. Um, the current Senate leadership prides itself in its ability to bring industry to West Virginia over the last during the last few years, however long that is. Um, if that trend continues, particularly in the Eastern Panhandle, what industries would you like to see? Let's take agritourism out because that's easy. That's the easy answer. So, what, <laughs> what, John's like, you know, no I'm mostly pushed <laughs> for, but thanks, John. Kill strap. We're so, a couple of politicians up here. Come on. <laughs> So what kind of, of industry would you support and what kind of industry would you reject in the Eastern Panhandle? And, okay. and to account for closing statements, uh, please restrict your answers on this one to a minute apiece. Okay. Well, I was just going to say small businesses, I think, are the backbone of West Virginia economy. That is really what I'd like to see supported. And I, I had a legislation, didn't get through, that would have had our economic development office. Instead of just constantly trying to attract big guys, how about you help the folks who are already here? to expand and grow. I agree with Senator Rucker completely. Uh, I think going after these shiny objects uh, does help in certain cases in certain parts of the state. But in terms of an overall economy, the thing we must do is to, is to provide greater incentives overall for small businesses so that, you know, every business in the state that has, say, six employees can add a seventh. That's the way to grow an economy. 
Okay, we'll move on to closing statements then. We'll go in inverse order of how we started them, which means that, Senator Rucker, you will go first. Well, thank you so much. And I again, thank you for having this. I really appreciated the opportunity to talk about some of these issues, and I really appreciate, you know, having this discussion with my opponent, who, although we don't see eye to eye on everything, I think you see we agree on a lot of things. And this is one of the things I want to leave folks with. It is possible that you have a clean campaign on the issues and that you can disagree and do it so politely. I'm very grateful that we have had a great campaign. I look forward to hopefully being reelected and continuing to serve the folks of the Eastern Panhandle and continuing to work with John on how we can make things better. Um, I, too, hope to be elected. Uh, and I agree with Senator Rucker. I, I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, running against her, debating her. And, and as I've said before, she is a conscientious public servant. Uh, she's a, she is a thoroughly honest individual. And the disagreements we have are strictly on policy. Uh, I will disagree that we agree on a lot of things. We agree, we agree on some things. Uh, how, how many it is, that's up to you all to decide. Senator Rucker, do you agree with his disagreement? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not keeping count, but I think we agree more than we ever thought we would. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Will the two of you have any additional public forums before Election Day? No, I no. <laughs> door to door. So we've done enough. <laughs> that's where you'll be seeing me. But if anybody ever wants to reach out to me, my website, patriciarucker.com. dot com. Sure, John, you want to give uh, our John Doyle at Comcast dot net. Uh, Very good. Well, I want to thank you both for uh, your availability, not just today, but in the forums that you've done at Shepherd University and also in uh, Inwood, and wish you both the best of luck on the election day. Thank you. And we'll be back with thank more. You.